Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, one more uh, Argo Contributors Experience Meeting. So I see, I think we have some new faces today, uh, at least not unfamiliar uh, names. So if you are joining to the meeting for the first time, can you please introduce yourself? And then we can jump into the agenda. Uh, and hey, hey, hi, this is Shubham Mil. So I recently joined Red Hat a month back. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is my first session I'm attending here. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wes. Um, I uh, recently started looking at uh, uh, a project uh, related to Argo CD, uh, the Progressive Rollouts Controller, um, and uh, wanted to contribute something in that general area. So I figured I'd join. Welcome. Is there anything in particular you are interested in getting into the controller? Um, just you know, promotions uh, from one application to another. Um, so uh, like, let's say you have a staging environment and it's set to sync from uh, master, the master branch um, or main rather. Uh, main will resolve to a, a git uh, SHA, right? Mm -hmm. And you want that Git SHA to then be set as the thing to sync for production. So if staging passes and you'd have the, you, you'd, um, Argo CD, the status of the application um, object in, in Kubernetes, mm -hmm. um, uh, after all the phases and waves and everything is, is successful, um, basically take whatever SHA that was deployed and set it to a different application being the production application, um, possibly in a, even in a different cluster um, to the SHA that was just deployed. Um, so I that's okay. the idea, yeah. Got it. Um, okay, and I think we have one more uh, new attendee. It's uh, the nickname is 1ER7CA. Can you please introduce yourself? That me. I'm wondering if it's me. Oh, okay. So, all right. No mind. Yeah, sorry. My okay. name's wrong. So, yeah, I'm Serena Nichols, and I've been on one other time or one or two other times um, PM UX related. So, sorry about that. I'll really? rename myself. How did you manage that name? <laughs> I, I came in through the app. I don't know. <laughs> I will fix it. Sorry about that. Good job. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me start sharing my screen uh, with agenda items. So, we have a lot. Thank you, Shobik. <laughs> I uh, <clears throat> I added mine yesterday uh, about Argo CD notifications, and it was only agenda item. Today we have more, so <clears throat> I will try to be as short as possible, so we can talk about uh, everything. Um, all right. So let me spend five minutes talking about Argo CD notifications, and I didn't plan to, uh, you know, give any demos. I just wanted to highlight that the project is kind of evolving and there is a lot of um, interesting work that needs to be done. And a lot of, basically all that came from uh, early adopters, people asking for more features and it, it's looking for contributors. <laughs> so, uh, and I will try to kind of, you know, uh, explain as much as I can within the, the time and hopefully someone might get interested. And I just wanted to spend like one minute to just remind what Argo CD notifications project is. And then I wanted to basically share the next milestone link. So um, like one minute in case you never heard about Argo CD notifications, it's, it's a side car that you can install into Argo CD namespace. And it provides integration between Argo CD and different notification services such as email uh, or Slack or Telegram, and list is kind of growing. And pretty much this overview page, which you see on the screen, it kind of, it gives you the shortest possible way to install it. And maybe if you execute this, I think it basically have like five steps, you basically going to, you would try most of the features of Argo CD notifications. Uh, so, and these steps explains that you need to install 
an additional uh, deployment into your namespace, and then you can um, install pre-configured uh, kind of set of settings that help you to decide what kind of notifications uh, you might want to get. And finally, you just need to pick an Argo CD application that you want to get notifications about, and you just need to apply an annotation. So it's that step. And this is kind of high level summary of Argo CD notifications. And it, there are much more kind of information. So there are different type of uh, notification types, I would say. It's here, I, I, we call them templates. So basically different uh, ways to uh, generate notification message for different type of events. And we have a way to configure events and we call them triggers. Basically it's a, it's a triggers let you uh, define an event which you are interested in and you can kind of provide a logical an expression that returns either true or false. And if that expression returns true, that means a notification should be sent. And I, I basically, I just encourage you to read the documentation. It has much better description. Uh, and, but during that meeting, I wanted to highlight that project is not even, not even close to feature complete. And we have uh, a set of kind of buckets of uh, features that we can choose to work on. And I just wanted to list that, you know, give you uh, that set of buckets. So first of all, people asking to add more uh, integrations. So more notification services, in particular, there is already a request to uh, integrate with Microsoft Teams and IRC. Uh, this is, and I'm pretty sure that list is going to grow because uh, maybe tomorrow, like, Signal is getting popular and people might want to integrate with Signal. Uh, so this is one. And uh, second, the, uh, as I mentioned just now, triggers and templates are configurable. And Argos identifications is trying to be kind of very user-friendly. So we provide a set of pre, you know, a good list of templates and triggers that is useful for people. And I think we just provided bare minimum I already noticed that early adopters of Argo CD come up with, you know, a better set of triggers and templates that they enhance them. And I feel like we just need to contribute more of more triggers and more templates into so-called so-called catalog of triggers, which is basically a YAML file, which has a definition and uh, of triggers and templates. Um, and Another area where Argus identification is going to grow, I'm pretty sure. So notifications is kind of misleading name. Uh, very soon after the first release, uh, a lot of users suggested that uh, in addition to just notifications, notification services, Argus identifications can send messages to just, to just hooks. Basically a generic webhook that can do whatever you can imagine. And we already, uh, have examples of how you can uh, start a Jenkins job, for example, when uh, application sync completed, or you can uh, uh, push, send a message to uh, GitHub and update commit status. And I'm pretty sure if we, you know, if we talk with end users, you will see even more examples of such integrations. And yeah, that's another area. And finally, uh, there is kind of a big, there is already several feature requests. So basically people are asking to implement chat ops uh, functionality using Argos identifications. And simple, simplest example is since it's already integrated with Slack, why don't we uh, embed approve button into the Slack message? So user could get notification about successful sync uh, and then let's say if it includes rollout, using uh, user can click approve button right in Slack. And yeah, there is a ticket for that and already it has several thumbs ups. And I'm pretty sure we can expand it to all type of uh, 
integration ser uh, notification services. I'm pretty sure maybe Telegram has the same type of functionality. Maybe it has a button. If it doesn't have a button, it could be just a link which you can uh, click to approve uh, the same process. Um, yeah, and there is, we have a milestone and that milestone has a set of tickets and all those, I mean, all these tickets are kind of ready to go. There is no need to start discussion about how to, like, I think most of them are, you know, pretty straightforward and it's a great place to start. And, you know, after that we can start thinking oh. about more open-ended like, like chat ops. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, does Argo CD um, already today emit Kubernetes uh, events? Yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, does does it do it for all major uh, state changes? It no. It I mean it. I think uh, currently Argo notifications mostly use events as a audit log. So uh, and I think for most important changes. Yeah, for phase changes, like if it became health, uh, the health ch status change or the sync status change, um, if you consider those as the major uh, ch changes, then the answer is yes. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking along the lines of uh, uh, something maybe similar to Argo CD notifications in that uh, if there's a project that can watch for specific Kubernetes events mm -hmm. and then deliver um, notifications or webhooks or whatever, that's just a little bit more abstracted um, and not and could be used uh, for many other use cases as well. Mm -hmm. um, I like abstractions. <laughs> yes, I, I feel like, yeah, there was a discussion, like basically this is not the first attempt of notification service for in general for like Kubernetes related projects. So Argo identifications, uh, I think it's kind of, the benefit it brings is that it is uh, a little bit narrow, but basically it's focused on Argo CD use cases and that's why it's just easier to use it. So, and I think I was, it's documentation is kind, kind of trying to communicate it. So the one of the, biggest differences is that you can start using it with no configuration because it, it knows kind of what you might be interested in and it knows what kind of events uh, and notifications you might want to get. Yeah, so um, this is why. It, mm -hmm. do, does Argo CD notifications use Kubernetes events um, no. in the background? It, it does not, and but it uses, it just, it's just a controller that keep watching uh, Argo CD applications. And it uses, basically, it, it has a list of so-called triggers and it tries to, you know, execute each trigger against each application if, and if any trigger returns true, that means a notification should be sent. That's kind of In an interesting time, um, I think maybe we should, um, we have documentation of the Mm -hmm. design rationale of why we chose not to go with a, a, con a controller, mm -hmm. uh, a general purpose controller and, and went with a library approach instead. So um, uh, why don't we move to the next topic and I'll, um, Wes, I'll put the link to the um, notification design um, document that explains the different um, choices that we did. There was attempts before where we did try to monitor um, any type of resource, including events. Um, but that general purpose controller um, ended up being not so useful because um, of the, the complexity of having to describe um, a, a way to take that change and then convert it to um, um, a notification event. Got but, it. Um, OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll look for that right now in, while we, we in Zoom. Talk. You're going to put that link in, in Zoom chat? Uh, yes, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. OK, thanks. Awesome. Yeah, and I, OK, and just like last uh, thing about notifications. I feel like in general, we chose to work on, you know, this kind of side projects in a separate repo. It really helps to move quicker, but as a side effect, 
uh, we just need to do some extra effort to get attention from both users and contributors. That's why I think I'm, I'm going to write a couple more blogs about Argos identifications and mention that during that meeting. Um, okay, that's all I had about this topic. I think we. Okay, I posted the link. Um, is there also, rec is this recording when we discuss this? Um, yes, somewhere? there is a recording. I will need to, yeah, I, I uh, you know, I will post, post, uh, post, send the link. Oh, wait a second, it's right there. Uh, oh, no, never mind. Okay, it needs I, to be uploaded, right? I will upload it. I think it's uploaded, but I need to find that link and I think I will have to send it in Slack because uh, Zoom will be done by the end. Uh, I, I might be able to find it while you continue. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so next item is uh, community housekeeping, QX, UI sessions. Uh, I guess Shobi QA did all this. Yeah, I think right. most of the mm -hmm. jargon from here is by me, a <laughs> bunch of different things. So I think, yeah, I think um, in general, I wanted to check if we could organize ourselves a little better with respect to the UI, UX discussions that we should be having. Because I think we all agree that, you know, significant UI changes go in, which sometimes modify the experience. Um, it is fine to have an open-ended meeting like this one that we have there, but it's just that um, I want to ensure that, you know, we have a little more organization so that we can have the right folks at the right meetings when we want to discuss these things. So um, my, my proposal in general is if we can, uh, mark at least one of the weeks, uh, like, sorry, so, so, so every week we have one meeting, right? So every third meeting, if we could mark that as a UI UX focused meeting, mm -hmm. so that we even rename the meeting invites accordingly, mm -hmm. and we ensure that we let the right folks know that, hey, we're going to have a UI UX focused meeting. Um, that means um, if we have that, that means we can ensure that UX experts join and find it productive. Mm -hmm. And we can also ensure that if there's somebody in the community who's looking at UI changes, they have a specific well-advertised time and day to come in and talk about it in detail. Um, if you're mm -hmm. okay with that, then I think, I, I, I would think that would be valuable in ensuring that. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that maybe it's good to reuse the same meeting, you know, uh, and discuss UI changes. How about if we just, Instead of doing it every third meeting, what if we just uh, introduce like a label in the same in the document, uh, UX, UI UX, and if we have more than let's say four, then we just transform next meeting into into a UI UX discussion. But yeah, we could do that. So I think the main risk with that is so okay. I mean th that's what I had proposed as well mm -hmm. initially, but I think the the risk with that is that. If for two or three meetings, we have no UI UX labels there, mm -hmm. folks who typically would have blocked this time of the day for this meeting would have something else on their calendar. Okay. And what happens is, you know, they, this slot is completely lost for those folks because, mm -hmm. you know, at least two or three meetings were not productive enough. So I could flip that actually. Well, what I could do is every third meeting at least, mm -hmm. um, we effectively have a UI UX focus meeting. And if there is no agenda on it, mm -hmm. then I will happily go and repurpose that as a normal meeting, typical meeting. Okay. Um, and vice versa, if if there are folks who want UI UX feedback on any of these other days and they say, hey, I really want this on the agenda, mm -hmm. um, then I think one of us, and that could be me, I could actually go and catch hold of the UX folks that we have at Red Hat and ensure that they do attend this in case mm -hmm. they were planning not to. But, yeah. but those are exceptions, right? But I think in general, if you come, we could come with the process that you know every third meeting is UI UX focused then, I think Serena, Bridget, Bo, those, they can actually join without having to move the calendars around. That will be good. Understood. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. Anyone else have awesome. an opinion? Serena, any thoughts? Since you do get impressed. I think it's fine. It's awesome. It's a good, it's a good idea. I, yeah, I think it's a great idea as well because um, Yes, I do. It's in, in saving time, especially for, for the UX people who, when we come on, it's not necessarily always um, UX related. I think that will be greatly appreciated for from our time side, for sure. So appreciate it if you guys do that. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. Okay, I think we can take notes on this and we mm -hmm. can move on to the next topic.
Okay, so um, the next topic, I, I believe, I know what, so it's a question about pull request, right? Uh, no, I think the next topic is assignment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, never mind. Uh, community housekeeping, okay, assignment of roles for GitHub Q&A. Yeah, and, that was by me again. Um, mm -hmm. I'll quickly go through what I really intended here. So I think um, we are getting a lot of questions on the GitHub I think question and answers that we have there instead of GitHub issues. And I think, thank you, Jesse, for actually starting that. While it's a good thing that people are moving there, I think in general, we need to ensure that we respond to them quick enough. And I think as maintainers and leads, I think, you know, Jan, Alex and Jesse, you folks already engage a lot on GitHub issues and PRs. And it is obvious that you wouldn't always get a chance to go and answer questions on GitHub Q&A. So, I'm proposing that on a rotational basis every week, if somebody could volunteer to say, hey, like, it's, it's, some, it's something like a triager role, but more of a question answer role, um, where you know, the, the, the role that person takes up for that week is to go to GitHub question and answers for Argo CD, for example, and ensure that questions are answered on time. Um, if you don't know the answer, it's fine to you know, poke through the question a little more and you know, catch hold of somebody like Alex to in and do that. But at least this way, we ensure that if somebody's asking a question, the turnaround time is quick enough and they do depend on this mode of uh, support than the previous mode where it was probably easier to go GitHub issues, it used to notify a bunch of people. So with that, I would say if at the end of, the end of this meeting or now if somebody says, hey, I would, I'd, I'd, I'd like to take up that role, um, that would be good. But prior to that, Alex, Jan, um, Jesse, what do you think? And everyone else. I, yeah, I feel like it's a great proposal because it's we just had the exact same discussion pretty much last week. Uh, so we spoke with about it with Jesse. I think currently we pretty much we use Intuit's team stand up to do that, and it's clearly not scalable. And we wanted to move it offline, and basically somehow make it visible to everyone, this triage process. And what you're proposing is even better. I feel like if we have, you know, official list of people who volunteer to do that and we have rotation, yeah, then it, it, it will help a lot because right now we only have time to answer simple questions. We have time to maybe spot real bugs and move them to the next milestone we not doing good job to answer hard questions because it's just impossible to do it during standard. Uh, yeah, so right. background. Yeah, and, 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 and like I said, like, like standup is pretty, again, it's pretty internal. You might not have everyone in there who asks those questions. Like for example, in GitHub discussions, right? You might have, like it, it could be a simple question with a tedious answer, mm -hmm. <laughs> which means, hey, how do we do this? We all know the answer, but probably will take you 15 minutes to write a long, nice long answer. Mm -hmm. and is why we, I think it should be rotated. Yeah. I, um, any other thoughts on this? If not, who would be the first volunteer for this? And basically, it in includes all maintainers, right? Uh, the list already kind of by default has uh, yeah. JC and, and yeah. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll say other than the maintainers, because the maintainers would anyway get pulled into a lot of things. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think this would be a non-maintainer role to begin with, at least just so that, you know, we can take some load off the maintainers so that you can focus on the issues and the PRs in general that you do. Though that's also everyone's job. I guess maybe we don't have volunteer yet. Maybe we should describe a little more, like what would it mean if someone volunteer right now? Um, right. Uh, could you could you click on the link GitHub discuss on on Zoom? I just sent you there. I mean, oh, it, okay. it would also be a great opportunity for people to to learn more about Argo CD, right? So yeah. it, when you are okay. answering questions and you're you're thinking about all this stuff, you definitely learn a lot, I guess. So right, I I I totally agree. Would you open a sample question here? Alex, just to... Okay, but I'm just going to open the first one. Uh, the recommended way to upgrade CIDs. And I guess the person here is, it's like a mix of two questions. How to use Helm to upgrade CIDs. 
in particular arbocidensia ideas. Right, and I think while while trying to talk to him, I figured I I started thinking with he's asking a general question about helm mm -hmm. um, using CRDs, and then I found out that no, he's probably talking about Argo CD, mm -hmm. our, our, the the helm distribution for the Argo CD release, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think these are very general questions. Some of them do need you to go and actually look at past issues, read documentation, maybe you know talk to somebody on the channel and then frame an answer and put it. So, yeah, that's how, I mean, the, so the role, role would mean effectively to first un talk to this person here and figure out what exactly the person wants to know. Sometimes the questions are very vague. They're just a one, one liners or two liners. The idea is to go in and ask and figure out, get some more details. And if you can ans answer the question, great. Um, if you can't talk to somebody who knows probably a, a a portion of the answer and then you can frame the answer yourself. So as Jan mentioned, this is an excellent way to know Argo CD um, because number one, you, you, you don't have to make PRs that may potentially take a lot of time and may need that level of focus and attention. Mm -hmm. Number two, of course, uh, you don't have to go and triage issues or you know, reproduce bugs. These are more general knowledge questions around the project. So this is a great way to get yourself familiarized with the project. So any volunteers for it? Um, I if... can take it. I can do it. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Shama. Yeah. No okay. So we have the first volunteer. Thank you very much. Um, no so let's yeah. put it down in notes, maybe somewhere in the top of the document. Mm -hmm. uh, GitHub discussions moderator for this week. Mm -hmm. and let's put Shama's name and then every week we can revisit if the same person wants to do it again or another person wants to take up that role. I'm just going to do it right now. Yeah. yeah sure. That would be good. Sorry. I had a um, thought just now. Um, we currently, we don't have a Slack channel for um, the, the members of the Argo Proj. Um, or maintain, or actually, do we have one for yeah members or and or maintainers? We have um, dev, which is kind that, of that. Yeah, that, um, yeah. I'm wondering if that would be useful somehow. In let's say there was a, I don't know if there was any kind of questions or stuff that were specific. I I don't want to keep adding Slack channels because yeah. But um, I just wanted to throw the idea yeah. if, there, if there was useful for other reasons, like um, you know, talking about the triage, like rotation and reminders and stuff like that. Then yeah, uh, maybe maybe it would make sense to have a private channel. Right, that's what I was. Doing. Yeah, because I I can understand it's it's often it might not be easy to. Uh, to ask such questions in public or you know, so maybe a private uh, channel would be. I, I wouldn't recommend a private channel to be very honest. I, I think, I think to be fair, I, I would say, I mean, let's go, to, let's go through this scenario. Like, and, and, and to be fair in the last few days, he even asked a bunch of dumb questions. And I think we all saw that, right? So I think in general, I would either go in and ask it in Argo Dev because I know there's a small number of people in there who would be, you know, listening to my knife question. Um, and if I'm okay with that, I'll do it there. And if I'm not okay with that, I'll probably ping Alex separately and say, hey, you know what? I have a very knife question. I'm super embarrassed to ask about it to others. And I'm probably gonna take care of it. But the thing about the private channel is you may not have everyone there who might be able to answer it. So actually, yeah, for this specific use case, I say it, it wouldn't actually even work because um... Shama, she's on our team, right? But she's actually not a member of Argo Project. Um, <laughs> yeah. She's like working yeah. her way up there because she recently yeah. joined. Um, and so actually it wouldn't even work in this scenario. So um, I think without a concrete uh, need for a private channel that I'm thinking about, um, let's not create one yet. Yeah. Jan, you good with that? Sorry. I just... Yeah, sure. No, it was just, it was just an idea. So... Uh... Maybe yeah yeah sorry you know, I was because just thinking out loud. I I can understand if 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 people don't want to ask uh, yeah I always say there are no stupid questions right there totally, are no stupid yeah. answers so <laughs> but so, so uh, I, 
I guess we can use the dev the dev channel for those stupid questions. Like if you get come across yeah all some, the time. I mean, you can some... find my stupid questions there, William. So, yeah, <laughs> I think we should use the dev channel they for know. stupid questions. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, shall we move Thank on? You. Yes. Okay. Let's move on. Um, yes. So that okay. Um, next topic is about one particular PR for one eight eight, and I guess so. Shobik is proposing to you know close the conversation. And yeah, I think I, this is. I I just asked that person to actually come yeah. to this meeting and probably I, talk. To I wanted about it as a to, general yeah. process. This is one of those PRs. I actually, I think we just. I remember it. I was reviewing it, and then I think we were rushing to create 1.8 release and then it just slipped kind of we so last during last meeting we talked about this type of prs so we have several several of them uh so good prs really close to get done and <clears throat> we just need to complete it so and this is one of those which have to be completed because it's it's a good feature we agreed on design and i think i just uh I just didn't have time yet to 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 look at it, and as far as I remember, last time I looked at it, I had a comment and I wanted to propose uh, an improvement, but to propose it, it would take me you know like thirty minutes of <laughs> time, and I just could not find this thirty minutes. But I think in this particular PR, I've seen quite a couple of pushes today. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so, I was asking some questions for the last two days that in general, yeah. why do we need this? Because there was no description, no GitHub issue on this oh. at all, and there was no docs as well. So um, I kind of engaged with this person for a yeah. while, and there were some changes that came after Thank that. you. Um, but, uh, so, so, so I think, so I, I think, so I, think mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't want you, Alex, to all, all, always go in and be the first person to do it in general, mm -hmm. I would say. And, and that's to say for the maintainers as well. We've got a good number of new reviewers in the group. Mm -hmm. I would say you know, this is a call, call out to reviewers that, you know, um, let's go through all the old PRs which haven't gone in for a while. And yes. since you're new reviewers, we, like, your we, your green tick mark makes sense. So I would say you should go in and do it. We agreed to, and basically I promised to just start a conversation and I wanted to copy old, old PRs that need discussion and at least talk with all maintainers and then we can basically decide if we want to close some of them uh, because some of them are kind of you know maybe yes maybe no but at the same time i know that at least a couple dozen of them like definitely yes and then we can make a decision if we want to you know reach out to original contributor first and if, even if contributor no longer have time to complete it it makes sense for us to kind of take over and complete for example, there was a feature that uh, a lot of people keep asking for. It's a, and it was created uh, more than one year ago. I doubt the same person, you know, can keep working on it like right now. If yes, then it's great. If not, I would not just throw away all his work. Instead, I would just, you know, totally complete it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think in in general, yes. I think if you could close this, this would be good. Uh, and also in general, like, so I think from the maintainer's perspective, if you could uh, go through that quick, you know, skim through the PRs and close whatever is not supposed to be open. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently, if you could, if our reviewers could actually go in and take a look at the other PR so that mm -hmm. um, the first level of review is done uh, and any obvious problems with the PR should be caught early on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm good. So this PR, I'm, I'm going to look at it, you know, if not today, then tomorrow, because it's it's kind That's of fine. inspiration, right? I know exactly what it is about. And I think I just need to finally spend this 30 minutes to. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, next. Uh, yeah. this is ticket, right? Maybe I should. Next. Go. Yeah. So, so this is a question I asked a while, while ago, and, and it's fine. Uh, we didn't answer it because this. Was, was probably uh, meant mm -hmm. for a feed. So this is in a GitHub discussions itself. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so um, so my question is, in general, I looked at the OIDC config that we have today, mm -hmm. there we specify, there we actually look for a URL which would eventually point to the well-known endpoints, with, which has all the details. Mm -hmm. um, 
a lot of other projects especially in the monitoring and alerting space i saw they also allow you to have the auth url and the token url mm -hmm. um what that helps is if some something is not purely oidc compliant you can still if you can specify the auth url and the token url you can go ahead with the oauth dance mm -hmm. um and i was just wondering if there was any specific reason why this was not supported i can go and look and make an enhancement to see if it works out so this, for spending time i wanted to remember if there's something is auth url and token url typically um uh, uh in the well known configuration of yes. uh, broadcasted mm -hmm. and then yeah. i see okay and then and then some projects i guess some oidc uh, providers don't advertise that in their well known configuration is that the I mean, well, to be fair, I, I would say, like some of them have their well-known endpoints configuration in a very different location altogether. So, but that so you what happened determined from the well-known configuration. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I mean, so the so the you know JSON which you know we typically parse to understand these that exists in a different location altogether, mm -hmm. um, and in such cases, you know, um, so. Argo CD login process says, hey, we couldn't figure out where to get the details from. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, yeah. so this is basically to check if, you know, was there, there was a reason. Yeah, sorry, Joel. Okay, I think um, I remember your question. I, I didn't understand the, the details. Now I, I think I understand a lot better, thanks. Um, so I don't have any, um, yeah, I don't think I don't have any objection objection to introducing those two fields to um, assist with the um, the login exchange. I think the only difficulty you might run into by adding those is that the library that we might be using might not understand how to um, you know supply that. If I recall correctly, I think it might just like accept. The well-known configuration URL, and then it, it handles all the yeah. handshaking from there. But if it's possible to specify this um, separately and, and achieve the same result, I'm yeah, I'm all for it. Sure, I'll 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 take a shot at it then. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't think there would be any um, security implications to this because it's all still an administrator. Uh, controlling these these things, so yeah, yeah. agree. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, next one again. My... Yeah, next one is strongly typed CRD for configuration. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm wondering had this ever come up um, that so so today we put in a lot of config in the Argo CD CM, Argo CD secret um, mm -hmm. objects, for example. Um, has it ever come up that, given the fact that they have a very rigid structure in how you should be putting content inside the config map, mm -hmm. um, there there is a non-explicit expectation of type there. Um, should we consider moving that to a more explicit mm -hmm. expression of type, which is um, something like an Argo CD configuration CR, which uh, is effectively a CRD, which you could add validation on out of the box, for example, mm -hmm. which you could version across different versions of Argo CD or maybe just different releases of Argo CD. Let's say you wanna implement a breaking change in that and you can advertise it using the general CRD validation schema that, hey, we are deprecating this, we're gonna to move to something else. So, because especially because this has grown pretty big mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if it's time to break that out of a config map and have our own CRD altogether. I know that it will help. I think there is a big problem right now. So Argo CD supports kind of imperative way to manage configuration. Basically, you can click button and then it will create a repository or cluster. We also support declarative way to manage it. And we do not support, support anything in between. So basically, if you use declarative way to configure repositories, and then tomorrow someone create uh, a new repository in an imperative way. And then next time you try to kubectl apply declarative configuration, all imperative settings will be wiped out. And I think it's a problem because 
I mean, I, I know it's a problem because I accidentally wiped out important imperative settings this way. And I feel like even if we don't uh, move straight to like CRD, I would at least split existing settings into separate config map keys. And I think CRD is yeah. probably a better option. So uh, is this, is this, sorry, I'm just asking for clarification. Are we talking about like the Argo CD uh, pod itself and, and how it's configured when it boots up? Or uh, are we talking about something else? It's a, it's, it's a config map and that config map used by all Argo CD pods. So controller look into some settings in that config map and IPI server also uses the same config map to get yeah. This is the config that says like, okay, here's how to configure OIDC. Here's how to configure local users. Here's how to, um, actually repos are also configured in there. Um, and it's would, kind of grown over time. Yeah, um, would, 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 would there be, I would say the only thing I can think of is a risk of getting into a, a catch-22 situation where in order to load the CRD properly or do something, you need to have the CRD, some information in the CRD mm -hmm. uh, or something like that. Um, I don't know if that, maybe that's not applicable, but it, you, I, there, I can see there being some sort of catch-22. It's, um, it's actually a, a valid point. Um, there's actually, a, today, because we inline structured data as a key in the config map, and that structured data better be well-formed, otherwise you can't load it. It's a sim similar problem. Um, and there are have been situations where like people, administrators who make a mistake in that data would somehow blow away their configuration. Mm -hmm. um, so I have my opinions on the CRD approach. Um, if, I, another but, fear I have about CRD is that we can transform into Istio and we have 21 yeah. different CRGs. I, I kind of, I was working recently on Argo CD notifications and right. I think I was trying to kind of apply loadings from Argo CD and I chose different ways. So I basically, in Argo CD notifications, there is a tool and that tool help you to manage declarative configuration. It just produces declarative configuration. And I think we're trying to do the same for Argo CD like right now. Uh, so Sharma worked recently on, a, so the CLI that takes a bunch of flags and these flags kind of provide validation and produce YAML. And that YAML is, you know, can go into Argo CD config map. Does it help, Shobik? Like, if we right. have a if we have a good CLI tool that you know let you make config changes locally, yeah, yeah without uh... yeah, that's yeah, actually I mean, a really that's... good idea. You make a CLI tool that knows how to make a you know your structured YAML or whatever it is inside of a config map because you're absolutely right. That config map really the the data value is a string, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> and so it's really easy to, to mess that up. Um, and there's not a lot of tools that will validate the data value of a config map because it, in the at the end of the day, it's just a string. Um, but having some way to generate it um, might be might be interesting. I use JSON it uh, today and I can, so I can actually go from a, you know, strongly typed if you will, uh -huh. um, uh, object and then use a JSON at standard library, which is manifest to, you know, YAML or manifest to JSON. And it will take that object and convert it to a string that, that is then valid for a config map. Um, that's what I do. Uh, but it's the same idea, right? right. Start from a strongly typed, uh, start from a strongly typed uh, representation and then convert it to a string. Right. Um, right. So I think, so I think on that, right? So I think the bit which I think might really help with respect to a strongly typed API is that number one, you can avoid, I mean, it, it's it's hard to make a mistake with that because mm -hmm. your CLI is effectively kubectl. It's going to stop you from doing something which the schema thinks mm -hmm. is, which the schema validation thinks is not valid. Number two, you can actually build out a UI which can be totally dynamic, which means 
you don't have to build a form with hard coded you know form fields you can mm-hmm. potentially load the crd schema and have that drive your entire form so which means if tomorrow we add five more elements into the config your form can be totally dynamic and it'll just load things and it'll show up so which means your we can potentially have a ui way of config making this configuration and that could be a one time effort basically to understand the schema validation and generate form fields mm-hmm. and yes i think um, and then the second thing like i said uh, it'll like the the schema validation itself is going to ensure that your content is of the right types at least mm-hmm. of course something can go wrong after that as well but that's same for the config map anyway um, yeah, the, so yeah. The, one thing i wanted to uh, talk about is that the um, c the config is not actually user facing right the um, typically when i think of a crd it is something that i expect uh, and user to uh, under, uh, possibly understand, like for example, in the Argo CD, the app spec is something they can modify in the in the uh, edit panel. Um, but uh, for this configuration, the only person who would ever modify that is an administrator of the Argo CD instance, and then no end user is ever going to understand or need to know this this structure. So purely, this is for operators. Um, right. And- totally. Yeah, and then that was actually one of the rationale uh, why um, notifications went with the config map approach. Because we actually, I was actually the one who originally went to Alex and said, hey, I think we need a, a CRD to have structured um, representation of notification configuration uh, because config map is just too unwieldy. Um, and then we, we quickly came to the realization that, that end users are never going to write this thing because it's always a notification. Um, uh, manager or uh, operator. And then I, at la- that point, we're like, okay, we're willing to make that person's life a little harder um, if it makes the end user's life uh, simpler, like they don't have to mm-hmm. know about these things. Um, yeah, there was other reason kind of CRD looked maybe strange because we would have to have a CRD that have to be created like once. Uh, basically yeah, only in the of- namespace of the... Um, yeah of the controller. And that would be the only place where that CRD exists in the in the cluster pretty much. Like one instance. Yeah, I mean, but... yeah, the CRD would effectively go across namespaces, but then if you, if somebody, like if I create a CR in let's say SBOS namespace, it wouldn't be reconciled because mm-hmm. Argo series is gonna reject that. Um, but if the same CR is created in the namespace where the Argo City workloads exist, mm-hmm. it would recognize it. Mm-hmm. Kind of similar to, let's say, the config map in that respect. That you can create the same name, config map with the name elsewhere. It's just that um, now every user in the cluster will know that hey, there's a CRD called Argo City config. Let's see what that mm-hmm. does. And, and that's the problem. So, so does that also mean that you would have an Argo CD config controller that is going to validate the CRD before, oh my God, yes. this is totally Istio here, uh, uh, before Argo CD can use it? Yes, I would say totally. Which like, means that if, if, if... like you need to have, you need to have a running pod that knows right. how to read the, the CRD resource, right? That it's created once. Right. And then that CRD resource once read is then like passed off to Argo CD or something like that? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that should be exactly same as how today we have reconciliation for, sorry. So, so we have something that watches those specific config maps and secrets. Uh, so if somebody changes those, um, it basically gets notified, picks up those changes and uh, sends the information to the different subscribers. So that's the same thing. It's just a CRD. Control which would be watched instead of a secret or a config map. So we already have that. It's just that instead of watching a secret or config map, we'll watch a specific type. Um, and then, like I said, we can all also interact with the operator there by saying, hey, looks like you've put in here 50 fields out of that, these 20 are totally garbage. Fix it, and only then it'll be applied, else we'll not apply it. Um, so it's kind of going there. Vest, does that help from what you're saying? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I was actually wondering if, uh, if I don't know how, uh, again, I'm first time here. Um, uh, so breakout sessions for this, like I, I do want to move on. It looks like there's th- four other bullet points here, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm interested in this um, and what kind of designs and, and uh, you know, problems and solutions and everything else 
Um, is, is there, how, how would you go about taking this kind of offline um, from this particular meeting and furthering the discussion? Yeah, I think. Um, continue it sorry. Yourself, honestly, I feel like, uh, and I, I wanted to say that I, I was really interested in the same topic as well. And I know that Sharma, she works on kind of the same problem right now. She, she's trying to make it easier to configure Argo CD settings. So at least I think two of us, you know, really want to be in that conversation. Sure. Should, should, awesome. I, just, so I, should I just post in the GitHub discussion then and, and then we can follow up from there? I think that was what I was about to suggest. Okay. Yeah, I think in general, I would say like things things like these would should start from a discussion. It should go through a feature proposal, proper design proposal, and only then, you know, it can even be considered for merge. But yeah, I think having a GitHub discussion to begin with would be great. Yeah, and I, I wanted to mention that the reason I was so kind of interested in that idea, I noticed that uh, so you know that Flux 2 recently was created and I think Flux developers, they kind of learned, you know, the same issues from Flux 1 and they had uh, opportunity to re-implement it and they chose this way. They basically use CRD and they have tool that produce CRD and it's working really well. So they already proved it's a good approach. At least I noticed that Flux 2 users really like that there is a CLI that you can use and it produce files. So it's kind of they declare they declarative from the beginning and it's uh, very attractive. Yeah, and it, we should Got use it. the learning as well. Yeah, we should. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think to add to that, even in the Argo CD operator that we have there, for example. So there, I've seen that there is a CM, so there, there's an Argo CD CRD there, which effectively spins up an Argo CD instance. And I can see that CRD is gradually bloating to actually include strongly typed config that's present in these config maps, mm -hmm. um, which is where I figured out that, hey, if we are putting in strongly typed configs because operators seem to be enjoying this. When I, when I say operators, I mean admins seem to be enjoying you know, using strongly typed because it's a lot less error prone. Uh, why not actually have the discussion upstream if you are interested yeah. overall in having a conversation on this. So yeah, there are a couple of points, you know, good can, candidates there to check on. Oh yeah, you could actually make an Argo CD operator. I love that these terms are ambiguous sometimes, but yeah, an Argo CD <laughs> operator. So the operator is what's in charge of managing the Argo CD instance itself. Oh, that exists. That's the- um, Oh, that already exists? Topic. Yeah. Well, that's... then wouldn't that, wouldn't that be like go down that path, right? Because that path, uh, if you have an operator that you need to tell that operator how to, how to configure the Argo CD instance already, right? Right, so I think the, the main reason I propose it here is that there is one role, who, so here's the thing. So, there are these cube admins whose job is to enable workloads on the cluster. And then there are these admins who are specific to these areas. So I would imagine there are, like, there are three cube admins who say, hey, these are the 15 different workloads that we can allow to run. And that is the you know, person who actually goes in and says, hey, let's get an Argo CD installed here using the operator. And now, now comes somebody who's an Argo CD expert admin who comes in and says, hey, did he, I know how to configure Argo CD. And this is what I'm going to configure in that CRD or the config map. So there's that second level admin who's going to be using this, um, mm. not the first level admin, whose job is to just, you know, enter, hey, you know, these YAMLs look fine. These role bindings look okay. It's not taking something major. And I'm just going to say, go run it. But how Argo CD itself functions, I think these configs are very specific to that, so, which is why the second level admin CRD, which may, I think, live with where the config lives today. So, Got it. All right, so uh, I think we still have time for at least one topic. Uh, so it's an overview of terminologies by Shobik. So we have sync, refresh, resync, yeah. and, and more. Yeah. Yeah, I think we did discuss this on Slack a bit, and I just wanted to finish it. Mm -hmm. got three more minutes. Yeah, I think um, I, I do see in the UI there are like two buttons, like sync and refresh. And mm -hmm. then in some places, we have something called app resync. Um, would be nice if somebody could give an overview of that, just so that I know I understand it correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can start from refresh. Uh, it's refresh refers to controller reconciliation. So by default, controller reconcile application 
every three minutes. And sometimes you want to do it quicker than that. And this is refresh. So refresh is it just uh, uh, if, when you click refresh button, it simply put an annotation uh, on application. And once controller noticed that annotation, it knows that reconciliation needed now, it reconciles it and remove annotation. And this is a very easy way to kind of, so basically you can click, uh, you can trigger refresh using kubectl. You can just use kubectl patch and then you can use kubectl watch to watch for application and just, you, you basically waiting for a moment when annotation disappears from uh, from the uh, right. System. Do you, do you mind if I, I'm I'm a I'm still also a new user at Argo CD. Um, I've been using it for a couple months um, uh, at work. Uh, if I give you my kind of layman's uh, explanation of what I think those two things mean, and then you can correct me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so so with refresh, there's a there's two step operation. The first step is is you're watching a particular uh, Git ref, right? And that might be a branch or it might be a SHA. If it's a branch um, or a tag, uh, you have to resolve that to a SHA and then go and get the manifest that exists at that point in time in the Git repo. Then compare that to what's in, in, in Kubernetes. Life state. Right. So refresh is that step is, is identify what it is that you might need to sync. Right, and then sync is the actual is is, you know, for lack of a better term, kubectl apply whatever that is that you that you found out. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Um, yes, it's accurate. Yeah, I, so, I think that's a that's a great way uh, to understand it from a um, end user perspective. So, and so to, quick question: Does sync talk to GitHub at all? Sorry, Git at all? Uh, or does it? I mean, as part of sync, you need to get manifest somehow if they the manifest might be cached already in this case there is no need to talk to github uh if not then yes need you would have to go clone repository generate manifests and then uh, kubectl apply it so sync is pretty much kubectl apply yeah uh, so sync, sync implies a refresh right like it, in yeah, order yes. to sync you must also refresh but they are they can be you might want to just refresh without making any changes. Just tell me what you would do if there are changes, right? And that's what refresh would do. Mm -hmm. And then sync is your opportunity to then go do that. So a sync requires a refresh, but a refresh can be done without syncing. Yes. Yeah. And I can maybe little give some more details about how it's done internally. So controller reconciliation is that controller tries to recompare target and life state. And internally we have like three levels of reconciliation. Uh, the hardest level means you, or highest level, means that you need to execute a less remote, the git operation and get the latest commit of, uh, of a target. And, and then you need to, you know, compare it with the life state and kind of compare manifests one by one. And basically when you click refresh, that means you need to reconcile application with this highest level of the heaviest uh, uh, possible reconciliation type. And the other types, for example, let's say if pod goes up and, and down, in this case, we just know that pod is not managed directly. And we simply uh, kind of refresh list of child application resources and store it for, for UI. So this is kind of, least expensive way of reconciliation. Um, yep. I think that makes sense. And I think I'll probably bug you more, but this I think was a good deep conversation there. Yeah, um, I, I just want to are... say that resync and refresh are, are end user facing concepts and then reconciliation, that's a developer concern yeah, yeah, also right. as is uh, more or less resync period. That's kind of like a flag you can control for how often these applications will go through reconciliation. Would, would a, um, uh, given that you've asked the question um, and I can definitely see the, why there is confusion, um, would this be an opportunity to, to potentially change what these terms 
are like what what is presented to the end user because i can i can i can see how sync and refresh to some people mean the same thing um and it would be confusing to like i don't understand what the difference is but something like maybe poll right especially you know what poll means in in git terms right mm -hmm. poll means to go get the upstream changes right um doesn't mean apply them it just means get them right mm -hmm. um and sync could potentially mean okay now now that you've got the upstream changes go do something with them um uh, uh but I, i'm wondering if there's an opportunity here to maybe uh change what these terms mean considering you brought it up as a question yeah, should we hit the, uh, yeah, should we, the, the person who asked, asked the question had to drop off. Um, to be honest, I think if we were to change, I, again, I think we we really should only have two user facing concepts, sync and refresh. Resync, I think, is um, Shopik uh, asked the question in Slack because I think he's going into the, um, the code right now. And um, we should never expose the word resync to our end users. I think that will definitely confuse our end users. Um, so with the with just sync and refresh, I I I can't see a good um, reason to change that terminology um, to to our use. I think that would cause maybe more confusion, and I think a lot of uh, more than just eyebrow raise. I think you'll you'll get objections to that. Uh, rename as well. Like the APIs is named that way. The CRD um, fields are are you know, auto sync. You know, all those things are all already kind of, in Got my it. opinion, set in stone. Okay. Okay. Uh, do we have Do we have the documentation at least with these terms and what they mean and a brief explanation somewhere? As if not, I'd like to. Yeah. What I'm realizing now is I think the, we don't have a um, uh, what do you call it? the like a dictionary, dictionary. Uh, a dictionary, yeah, a, a term, yeah. Um, an index. If you uh, is that the term? I don't know. If it's no, there's there. another term I'm thinking of. It's but it's it's kind of like a dictionary, but it's something else. It's at the end of the book, and then yeah, at the end of the book. <laughs> What's it called? <laughs> we we have we have something like that in the document. Oh, do we? I think yeah, but it's it's in concepts. I think oh. concepts. But it's okay. it's it's not it's not complete. So um, yeah, in the core concept. Okay. So, oh, okay, okay. There it is. This so. is ex actually exactly what I was, I was. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so it actually it has it, um, but maybe it's not. You know, we no one knows it. Like even yeah. we didn't remember it exists, and yeah. maybe. Uh, Oh, you can be blinded by being close to the code. <laughs> Core concepts is the third thing in the list when you're reading through. <laughs> so it is up front. And, you know, I think for many of us, we've we've read it maybe once and then, okay, that's that was interesting. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, Alex, I'll propose that maybe we jump to Wes's topic because Shobik asked a bunch of questions. He's also left. So, um, oh, William had... Oh, but yeah. I, I, since since uh, Wes's first time, I thought uh, yeah. I, I didn't want him yeah. to walk away with. Uh, right. Yeah. Sure. I'm okay. I, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to bring this offline too. I just wanted to bring up a uh, a potential feature. Um, I'm working on a POC for this, but I think that this is simple enough that this could just be a simple feature in Argo CD. Um, and I briefly explained it earlier, but I'll do it again, which is uh, this idea that you have multiple applications that depend on each other, right? So you have a staging version of your app. Um, and of course, app is overloaded here. Uh, so I'll say microservice because Argo Cita doesn't use that term anywhere. So I have a microservice and I deploy that to staging. And so that is one, that is an application for Argo CD, right? It goes to my mm -hmm. staging cluster. And then I have another application. It's the, my production version of that microservice. And I want to promote a, a, a uh, the resolved SHA uh, of the you know of my Kubernetes manifest from staging to production. So I don't want to auto sync production. I want to auto sync staging directly to a branch, say main or whatever. But for production, I don't want to auto sync. I don't want to push to main 
and then have both staging and production yeah. get deployed at the same time. I only want staging get deployed and then only when staging is healthy. So using all of the built-in functionality of Argo CD, right? Waves and, and um, phases, um, you can do basically anything you want, want right? Like post sync, you can run various jobs to, you know, run tests or, you know, whatever you want, right? And at the end of the day, you'll have an application health state, right? That's like this application was successfully synced. Everything ran and everything exited with exit code zero and we're good to go. Um, at that point, take whatever resolved Git SHA that happened and push it to a different application um, within Argo CD. That, so that's the underlying concept of uh, at least what I want to do and, and what I started. Uh, the, other, the other guy um, uh, named his project uh, Argo CD Progressive Rollout. Progressive Rollouts or something like that. Um, and I think he might be wanting to do a little bit more than what I'm describing, because I really took some time to boil it down into the essence of what this feature really is. <laughs> and I don't want to do any more than just this bare essence. Um, I want to so, see if there's existing functionality to do everything else. So uh, I have a couple of questions. Have you, uh, have you, so people have been able to achieve a similar use case using um, an app of apps pattern in con conjunction with um, sync waves annotation on the apps. Are you familiar with that um, that technique? Uh, so you haven't. So you simply have uh, an app of apps that describes both staging and production. And right. So so that the app of apps pattern and. Um, I'll caveat this with the, um, the fact that we're trying to move away from that pattern. But um, the app of apps pattern um, is basically you have an umbrella app, which is containing nothing but uh, child applications. And that's something you you commit and check in into the Git repo. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then you're staging and QA and prod um, app, uh, child applications are um, have a wave a sync wave annotation. So you want your uh, QA to go first, so that has a wave of one, a zero, and then your uh, staging goes. Oh, next. this is yeah. just this is just layering waves on top of waves. So within so you you might have waves within your staging app, but your parent app that describes both staging and production is also waved. Is that what you're saying? Well, the umbrella app has no wave because it's just a single app that you sync. But as the, the process of syncing that umbrella app um, will kick off, uh, like, because in Argo CD just sees these as resources, applications as, as resources at the end of the day. And so waving those applications are no different than waving like a config map before, you know, a deployment. Um, it's the same exact process. And so what people have done to, uh, to achieve a similar use case is that they have a, they use the app of apps pattern, but they apply wave annotations to the child apps in order to achieve a pipeline effect. Um, uh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so um, I caveated that because I, um, I I know of the Argo application set. Thing. Yes. Yeah. I'm exactly. That. So that is on that helps replace part of that pattern um, in that it lets you um, kind of move away. From from, um, it makes it easier to manage those child applications, one. What it doesn't solve is that um, that waved approach that I just mentioned. And we had another um, proposal about something, I'm, I'm calling it a, a, uh, a sync job, uh, but I, I don't know if that's gonna be what, but the idea behind a sync job is that just like you have, uh, Kubernetes has like, um, a job object that just is, is a one-time execution of a, um, a pod, basically, right? And then, you know, Argo workflows is another uh, concept of a ephemeral run of something. Um, in, in Argo CD, sync job is an idea where that, that thing is, kicks off and then syncs a bunch of applications in um, some, some order and maybe things can happen between that or, or whatever, but, um, and maybe it, it, it looks at 
labeling to understand how to do the ordering, but it's basically provides a more sophisticated way of, um, of chaining together syncing of applications um, through a, a specification of, of how you describe how you want that to happen. Um, so it would be more powerful than the waived annotation approach. Um, and that's something we have been actually talking about for a long time, uh, just haven't had uh, the time to, or, or person, a resource to, to actually investigate that. So, uh, so, so, so actually another follow-up question regarding that, um, you know, the, the, uh, what is open, open question, which was when does Argo CD consider something synced, right? So like as an example, a job can be successfully deployed and started, right? But not necessarily ended, right? That job doesn't have to end mm -hmm. uh, for Argo CD to be like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm good on my end, right? Whether that job succeeds or not is not anything I need to be worried about. Um, that uh, potentially so I, I would be a problem. The answer is pretty easy for sync. Basically, if you run, it's, it should be the same answer. If, if I ran kubectl diff on a, on this resource, and that kubectl diff says no, there's yeah, there's no difference. Then we're in sync, and that and then that um, the application sync status is an aggregate um, status of all of the resources. Are they all? Is there any difference? And and that aggregates up to the application. And if there's no diff in any of my um, application resources, then I'm in sync. Got it. Okay. So it doesn't, so Argo CD then like, what about the health of the, of the, of the resources? Right. Does it do anything to look at the yes. health of an object? So, so yeah, so that's why we have two statuses. Um, the sync status, which is nothing but is, is there are any differences. Yep. Health is understanding, looking at a single resource and looking at status um, and understanding, okay, I do I have, three out of three replicas and all are all those three replicas available, then yes, my deployment is considered healthy. And so we have built in health checks for many of the native Kubernetes kinds, which makes sense to have a health status, but things like a config map has, doesn't make sense to have health, right? There's no such thing as an unhealthy config map. Um, right. Sorry to interrupt you. I, I, we already ran out of time and I see this starts including people. <laughs> yeah. Have to take it offline and maybe continue during the next uh, meeting. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I'll post a, uh, I guess, a discussion about this, um, and and maybe we can follow up from there on the GitHub project. Cool. Sure. Okay. Right. Okay, and I think yeah, it's time to wrap up because it's already eleven fifteen or like fifteen minutes past uh, end of a meeting. Right. Okay. So see you everyone uh, next week. Thank, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Alex, for hosting. Bye bye. Bye.